Good evening and welcome to a Thursday evening virtual program coming to you from the Genealogy Center in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. I hope it has been and continues to be a day filled with good luck for you. No matter how you measure that good luck, whether it's a winning lotto ticket or whether it's another fact for your family story, whether it's another person on your ancestor chart. I hope it's been a lucky day for you. Uh, welcome to this evening's session on St. Patrick's Day, this evening's program. I'm really excited about this program for several reasons. Uh, one, we have a good friend from the Indiana Historical Society with us this evening, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. Uh, we also have two of my colleagues who are really good at Irish research, helping people find their Irish stories and Irish records, um, have been doing research for a number of years. Uh, one of my colleagues has been over to Ireland a couple of times, so I'm going to have a real good session this evening. So it's different than a normal session. We'll put it into chat a couple times, but I'll tell you right up front here, there is no handout for this evening. This is kind of like our fireside chats. It's supposed to be a conversation, a conversation where you have some questions, some musings, some brick walls, some stopping points in your research, and you'd like some other opinions on it. So this evening, it's really Let's Talk. And it's Let's Talk, Irish Records and Stories. So we will get started around 6.30, but before then, we will go over some details. Detail number one, like we enjoy every time we get together, um, use the chat to tell us where you're from and to communicate with each other, to welcome people you haven't seen in the chat for a while, to maybe do some crowdsourcing, maybe send out a family name or so just to see if anyone else is researching that same family. Just don't make it a common one because then everyone will, will, will weigh in. Um, the chat is for you. The Q&A is for your questions that you would like us to talk about this evening. So you'll find the chat at the bottom of your screen if you're on a PC, under more if you're on a tablet, you'll find the Q&A in that same place. Um, typically on a PC at the bottom, next to chat, under more for, for a tablet. So click on the chat, tell us where you're from, wish everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day. If you have questions for us, now is not too soon to put a question into the Q&A portion, because this will be a total Q&A session where we share tips and tricks and sources for doing Irish family history, family stories, uh, better than we have before. I would like to just talk to you a little bit about uh, where you can find forthcoming ACPL programs, but we'll do that at the bottom of the hour when we begin our conversation, our let's talk this evening. So we have just a few minutes before 630. So let's uh, take a look in chat and just see where people are coming from. Um, gosh, we have some, some regulars, and we're always so happy to see that, uh, from Springfield, Ohio, uh, from Avon, Indiana, close to Indianapolis. I actually know where that is. Been there several times. From Virginia, uh, Bellevue, Ohio. And yes, we have some of our friends from the land down under. Some often join us on Thursday evening. So someone from Australia, uh, Colorado, Michigan, uh, some good friends from Columbus, Ohio, from Utah. Um, so uh, great to have all of you here. Um, someone asked in the chat, and should we all be amazing, at, and, and we should all be amazing at conversation with that classic Irish gift of gab. Yes, I, I hope we do have we do have good gaps this evening. Uh, great comment. Uh, people joining us from Dallas, from Tennessee, from Kentucky, Vancouver, Washington, and a great hello from California. Um, more individuals from Indiana, always great to see. Um, some more friends from north of the border in Michigan. So just great to see so many people coming in this evening. We should have a lot of individuals for our chat. Again, just a quick reminder that the chat is for you to tell us where you're from and to talk to each other, uh, crowdsource some information, if you will. The Q&A is for you to put questions uh, for us to talk about this evening in our Let's Talk session. So 
wonderful. There's been two questions already posted in chat, so we hope you continue to do that. So it'll be a great, a, a great evening. Again, welcome. We're just a few minutes before the bottom of the hour when I will introduce um, my friend from the Indiana Historical Society who will share with us just a few minutes on neat things that are happening at the Indiana Historical Society and a really nice event for us um, who are interested in maybe getting out and going to conferences again uh, this summer. I won't steal all of her thunder, but a pretty, pretty amazing event happening uh, the summer in, in the Indianapolis area at the crossroads of America. So uh, welcome. I think we're close enough to the uh, bottom of the hour. Uh, Lauren, if you wanted to uh, unmute yourself and turn your camera on. Um, this is Lauren Pechtel from the Indiana Historical Society. Uh, she has an exciting title. I can never remember it, but it's like member engagement, like events and engaging membership. So you can tell Lauren what your real title is and to tell them some interesting things about the Indiana Historical Society. Yeah, thank you, Kurt. Um, so I hit share screen, you're only seeing a slide, correct? Correct. Awesome, thank you so much. So thank you, Kurt and Allen County Public Library Genealogy Center um, for inviting me back. Um, as we continue research roundtable into Let's Talk um, and, and move forward with this awesome partnership. Um, so as Kurt said, my, my title is, my title um, has changed a lot, but I'm a manager of engagement. Um, I was originally hired here as a coordinator of genealogy and family history programs, specifically um, to teach genealogy classes and um, think of new ways to do genealogy programming in addition to I'm hiring some really awesome speakers and scholars like Kurt and some other folks um, at the Genealogy Center as well. Um, but we've been, been doing some shifting to uh, be closer with what we consider kind of our driving force that we are Indiana storyteller. And that also encompasses um, kind of the old Northwest. And when we talk about our conference Midwestern roots, what we're really doing is talking about the old Northwest and how we understand it um, so basically, Indiana in the center and everyone around us. Um, so that's some of the stuff that we have going on here. And as my um, title has changed, that means I also do a lot of other exciting programming as well attached to everything else that's going on. Um, so tonight, I'm here hanging out with you guys to chat about Irish records and family history. On Sunday, I am here in the History Center all day for our escape room, escape the, the Indiana History Center at, here at the Eugene and Marilyn Glick Indiana History Center, um, where we have two escape rooms to enjoy. Um, so you can walk into our reading room after hours and dig through records of the researchers before you trying to find John, John Dillinger's secret stash of cash. Um, so beat the clock to find the money, and then you can also head down to our exhibit, you are there exhibit, Madam C.J. Walker, um, right before it closes. It will close April 3rd, 2nd, something like that. So it's coming right um, up. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's been open for quite some time with everything going on. Um, but you need to help the, the Walker factory staff. Um, Madam's away and you need, you need the secret recipe um, to help so everyone actually gets paid for a day's work. <laughs> A day's work. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Beat the clock, find all sorts of clues and puzzles and do that. And then I'm here Tuesday evening again um, for uh, a film documentary and Q&A discussion about the life and legacy of Holocaust survivor Eva Core with um, film director Ted Green. Um, from, it was through WFYI, our public um, right. TV station, and Eva Core's son, Alex Core. Eva was a Mengele's twin, meaning her and her twin um, were tortured by Dr. Joseph Mengele's during um, the Holocaust. Um, and they, she came here to Terre Haute, Indiana, and it has just a wonderful legacy of, of healing and hope and empowerment. So that's just some of the stuff we have going on over here. So, Excellent. Um, exciting times in Indianapolis. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so, 
if you don't know a little bit about us, because I know people are coming in from all over the place, we are Indiana Storyteller, connecting people to the past, but we're also here to help you connect to your own past and how we are all connected together. And we do this through the millions upon millions of pieces of paper that tell Indiana's unique stories and find intriguing and unexpected ways um, to remember that through our publications, exhibitions, programs, and stuff like this. Um, so we take pride in helping people find their own story, whether that's here or not. And that's where a lot of our family history programming comes in. Um, I'm gonna put some links in here about some of our special, collect special collecting initiatives as they relate to um, COVID-19, Project Take a Stand. Um, we also have collecting initiatives attached to Latino and Asian American experiences in Indiana and um, a lot of other stuff. So cool. uh, if you want me to talk about the conference now or later, you tell me. Why don't you give them a few uh, tidbits now and we'll also uh, hit it toward the end of the hour as well, so. Awesome, thank you, Kurt. So. Coming up, we have our somewhat biannual Midwestern Roots Family History Conference. Typically it's every other year, but some stuff gets in the way and we work with it. Um, this year, it, this conference is way different than previous conferences and I'll talk about it more later. Um, but our theme is how immigration and migration um, have impacted the story of the Midwest. Um, and our featured storytellers are international award-winning um, Miami Tribe of Oklahoma bead artist Katrina Mitten, um, amazing speaker, social historian, newspaper researcher Timothy N. Pinnock, expert on African American history, and the wonderful Kurt Witcher. Um, but the storytellers, scholars, more options, more fun, coffee and snacks, we listen to your needs, and a lot of food and inspiration. Um, and registration opens in a week. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks so much, Lauren, for sharing yeah. that with us. Um, if you would want to, there you go. I'm going to share my screen really quickly before we get into uh, tonight's wonderful presentation. And it looks like I don't have what I wanted to have up. So we'll just try this again, um, just to see why it's not doing what I thought it was going to do. So. You'll bear with me. We'll get this little technology thing worked out or not. I think we'll just leave it for now. Um, I don't seem to be able to grab my one monitor. So technology is fun. So on St. Patrick's Day, I guess I'm not as lucky as I thought I would be. So maybe all the luck will be with our um, uh, my, my three colleagues here this evening. I'd like to introduce uh, John Beatty, who's been with the department a good number of years. Uh, a very good number of years. I think he started when he was five, though, so he's really <laughs> not that old. Um, has done is the department's bibliographer. Has done a lot of research in his Irish roots and helping others do Irish research. Elizabeth Hodges, another one of my uh, colleagues, is part of the department's programming team. Uh, she's had a great experience at the New York Public Library, at the Tenement House, and. New York City and brings just a really wealth of information and an interest and background in Irish research. So um, thank you so much, John and Elizabeth for joining us this evening. And I think between the four of us, we should have a very quick 48 to 50 minutes here. So I'm gonna get right to the questions that are uh, starting to build and I'm excited about that in the Q and A. Uh, the first question is where could we find alien records in Ireland? Can I share my screen? <laughs> Absolutely. Have not. Have I not given you prerogative? No, I'm just that? saying yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Go. Okay. So assuming you're referring to the alien register, which is this. So the alien register was from 1914 to 1918. So any non-UK citizen that was appearing in Dublin at the time had to register with the police. Uh, this, I will put a link to this in the chat, but um, this came from the Geolog Geological Society of Ireland's website. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're not referring to this specific register, the next place I would try looking would be the National Archives of Ireland. So, Very but it's good. pretty juicy stuff. The spreadsheet is fun because if you find a name, which most of these names are actually, uh, most of them are Jewish. Um, if you click on it, it brings you to the original image, which is fun. We all love that. 
So I'm going to stop sharing and put that link in the chat. Hey, John, anything you wanted to, to add to that? I don't. I agree. The National Archives would be the place to, to start for something like that. I'm not familiar with that, but that's, that's interesting. If not the National Archives in Ireland, check the National Archives in England. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it de depending on the time period, uh, if it's pre-1922, those records could have been lost in the public records office. Uh, but there would be copies because Ireland was still a part of the United Kingdom before that. Um, mm -hmm they could be in in london instead so check both excellent excellent thank you so uh valerie asked i believe my ancestor was an englishman given property during the munster um during the munster plantation don't quite understand that but during the munster or maybe on the munster plantation the records i have only go back to tippery in the 1700s how do i bridge the 200 years last name Sligsby, S-L-I-N-G-S-B-Y. Well, the registers of deeds be, have begin about 1708, um, and they were voluntary. But there are records that go back that early. Um, prior to that time, I don't. There's not. There's not that many grants, but they might be in the National Archives. But, but you certainly want to get through the 18th century for sure. And those deeds have all been digitized, microfilmed and digitized by Family Search. You can get on the okay. website and see it. Um, unfortunately, the deeds in Ireland are indexed by grantor, not by grantee. Uh, and so it can be somewhat more challenging to, to find. There is a website though that's on Roots Web where it's a, like a crowdsourced website where they're trying to index the deeds, both grantor and grantee, okay. by people who are contributing to it. So that's something to look for as well. I think if you did Registry of Deeds Ireland Index in Google, it would come up. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a growing site for information. People are, are turning things in. I have gone through the, the grantor books for the areas I'm looking for, mm -hmm. looking for grantees out of it, just by going through A to Z and looking for, for grantees that I wanted. And, and so it's possible to do it. It's just sort of labor intensive. Yeah, there's the Registry of Deeds Index Project. That's perfect. That's what I'm speaking of. And that's a, that's a good tool uh, that people who are con can voluntarily contributing uh, mm -hmm. material to that. It looks like you can search by townland, by grantors, or just main index entries. So something earlier, if you're back into the 1600s and 1500s, you almost have to get into the estate papers. If there are estate papers for the family where the family was renting, and uh, and see if those estate papers are there there are a number of websites and there's there's a microfiche set that we have called hayes h-a-y-s index of irish manuscripts okay and, uh, and it, it indexes family manuscripts i'm sure that's probably digitized now i'm not sure offhand but i know the fiche set is, is available and uh, you can look up family papers in there if you know the family that was the landlord family and to okay. see if there are records of, of leases and deeds that go back earlier Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Um, great, great bit of information. Um, we're going to take one more question before we pause for an information break. We don't have commercial breaks. We have information <laughs> breaks. So um, the, the next question is, uh, my O'Neill family came from um, Carlo in 1805 to New York City. To your old stomping grounds, uh, Elizabeth. What records can I use for around the rebellion of '98? Which is John's wheelhouse. <laughs> well, you need to know the parish uh, that they're from, if possible. They're if they were Protestant. All the Carlo registers are on a website called uh, IrishGenealogy.ie, and uh, that has Tullow and a number of other parishes there. If they were Catholic, and O'Neill sounds Catholic. Um, you'd have to look, uh, there are, there are rosters of, um, of rebels that are in what's called the rebellion papers that are in the National Library of Ireland. We have photocopied some of them here over the years, uh, but they're in the, they're in the National Library of Ireland. Uh, and you'd want to see what parishes uh, have Catholic records going back uh, into the uh, 18th century. There may be a few that do go back that far. Uh, remember that there was in Ireland, there was a lot of prejudice against Catholics, there, were, there was something called the, the, uh, the, um, the uh, penal laws that prevented Catholics even from uh, gathering and worshiping. But there were some congregations that have records even despite the penal laws. So the, you can sometimes go back uh, if, it's, if you're lucky and the records survive for some towns. Very good. Very nice, John. 
What are you showing us, Elizabeth? This is irishgenealogy.ie. I'm searching the church records for that surname uh, in Carlo. I recommend being as broad as you can with using irishgenealogy.ie because something about, this is a, a website created by the Irish government. Mm -hmm. So it is not ancestry. It is not by my past. <laughs> it, you, have to, you have to really play around with it but it has such good stuff. Um, and for their civil records, since I'm on this website already, I do wanna bring up that they've actually just uh, expanded their civil records. Uh, so their civil registration, uh, I know deaths now go from 1845 to 1971. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a place to look for stuff. So I just wanna bring that up. Excellent. Thank you both for that. Uh, so our first information break at the 15 minute mark, um, Lauren referenced it in her, her, her comments. In 2021, um, our two organizations, the Genealogy Center and the Indiana Historical Society uh, partnered on what Lauren referenced as Research Roundtable. And we did a uh, every other month uh, get together where we talked about all kinds of things, didn't we, Lauren? Um, we had some of the younger genealogists talk about expectations and how they get in the field. And we talked about various various topics. Uh, one thing that Lauren and I share in uh, common is the whole idea of um, researching in 4D, which is like better contextual research. So I think, um, well, I know Lauren came up with that nice catchy phrase. It gets people's interest like, what is 4D? Is there such a thing as 4D? Um, so at the end of the year, when we were evaluating um, how we wanted to move forward, uh, shifting priorities for both organizations, but yet still focused on family story and family history, we said, well, what if we do a let's talk quarterly instead of six times a year and place it on a particular date? So that's how we got to here, right, Lauren? Yeah, we started Research Roundtable because I noticed in a lot of Facebook groups and <laughs> earlier in 2020, a lot of people were missing conversation when we adjusted everything to go to webinar or Zoom webinar, um, where there's just not an opportunity to see people's faces and use audible <laughs> conversation. Um, and so that's kind of where it started. And as we go back to more in person, it's not needed as much. Right. right. Very good. So there'll be a couple of more information breaks for us to look forward to. Let's move on to the next question. We've got some really nice questions in here. Uh, Stephanie writes, I have an ancestor who was born in uh, Kilkenny, Ireland, about 1821. He died in Vermont. I'm having a hard time finding his parents. How can I find birth records? So born in Kilkenny, 1821, died across the pond in Vermont. So I would, uh, to, surname, this is where surnames are really important, especially for Ireland, because it could kind of help you figure out Catholic Protestant, if you don't already know. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, I'm a Hodges, very Protestant. <laughs> very Protestant. Um, Beatty. Okay, so they were Protestant as well, correct? That's Irish, yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's going to kind of alter what types of records you're going to look for. You're going to want to try to find church records for that time period, but the church records can, can be spotty, uh, which is the problem. Um, when in doubt, in my opinion, uh, contact those local churches uh, not everything is going to be online. Uh, you will not believe the amount of stuff hidden in a, a church attic. Um, and contact the local societies, too. Get some ideas from them. Mm -hmm. If I would add, too, I would suggest maybe a search on rootsireland.ie. Yeah. You, can, you can buy searches through them. It's a, it's a paid site, um, and you, you buy searches. Might be worth a search looking at that. Um, you might want to look at the tithe plotment lists and the Griffiths valuation of Ireland for the last name. I don't know what time period they 
he, yeah. they immigrated from from Kilkenny to uh, Vermont, but you might still catch up some people there either in the tithe books, which cover 1820s, 30s, 40s, and, and the Griffiths, which is a little bit later, 1850s and 60s, but they may have relatives that stayed behind in Kilkenny. So you'll want to try to zero in on town lands and parishes in Kilkenny where that name is associated. If it's a real common name, it may not be that helpful, but if it's more unusual, there may only be a few pockets uh, okay. that will allow you to, to zero in on your, your research a little bit more. So and, if I if I can yeah. just probe that an instant further, John, because um, I think what you said is really important. Just want to make sure everyone got it and heard it. When, when you say a few pockets specifically, what are you talking about? Clusters well, there may be families? There, there, yeah, clusters. Yeah. There may be family clusters of certain names that are in, associated with certain areas. And some names are so common that you're going to find Murphys yeah. all over. But but if you have a name that's a little more unusual and it's in County Kilkenny. Uh, it might be associated with only a couple of different right. towns. And, and so that will help you focus your search a little bit more. Yeah. There is a website uh, made by uh, this wonderful man named John Grenham. Mm -hmm. I'm a little obsessed with this website and he puts all that into maps. I'm going to share my screen and just kind of just to show you what that looks like. So I just did a surname search for Carol, right? So this will show you how many carols there are in the country, but you can change it based on what type of map. So say you want carol births mapped between 1864 and 1913. And this gives you wow. all the variant birth records with the name variations. It breaks it down by districts and births and it, it's all linked. It links you right back, of course, I need to prove that I'm human. It links you right back to irishgenealogy.ie. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's fabulous. Definitely recommend it. Excellent. Excellent. I, I just wanted to emphasize that point, John, because I think um, partially what drives Lauren and I to be excited about researching in 4D is the fact that people lose that context, like mm -hmm. look for clusters of people together so so um great answer thank you thank you both for that so moving just on one thing, just one thing to add quickly to that too just because ireland has something called town lands which may not be familiar term to what americans and or people doing british research might think and, and town lands are fields or sometimes a few acres sometimes hundreds of acres but they're they're around a parish a parish is comprised of town lands so okay. in kilkenny there'll be a, a town and then there'll be town lands around it and the and the the um uh, the Griffiths valuation will show people by town land. And that's sort of the gold standard for doing Irish research because you wanna know if you can find it, uh, not just the town, but the town land, because that'll get you even more specific. So just- Cool, excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so um, I hope that helped um, Stephanie. Um, let's move on to uh, Joanne. She. Uh, writes um i'm trying to find my grandparents their son I'm trying to find my grandparents their son my dad francis kelly was born in 1899 in glasgow all we have is his father was james kelly and mother helen graham so francis kelly father james kelly mother helen graham we think they may have come from donegal can you offer some places to look for them Grandfather passed away about 1909 or so in Glasgow. So trying to find my grandparents. Well, Some Irish civil dead. records, Irish civil births and deaths begin like in eight, about 1864. There's, they can be spotty, but that should be the time period uh, that those parents were born. The, the, the kicker is where in Donegal, if you think that Donegal is a place where, because there's going to be Kelly's all over the place, but you might want to try to find a marriage of them. That's probably where I would start, uh, to try to find their marriage and, and zero in on a parish from that. That should give you places uh, to work with, uh, whether they married in Scotland or whether they married in Ireland, that's a question you're gonna to have to try to, to figure out, but there might be churches in, in Glasgow. You might want to look for the baptismal records in Glasgow of their children, and that might have some clues in it too about where the family came from. Very good, very good. I hope that's um, helpful um, to to our our uh, participant this evening. 
Um, the next question comes from Debbie, my great grandfather. Pat, oh, here's a good one. Patrick Galbraith, really rare name. Murphy was in the British Army in India. This would be in the 1840s. Where would I find his records? I'm just guessing from Debbie's question, his military records or, or maybe any records. So great grandfather, Patrick Galbraith Murphy, British Army in India, 1840s. Where would I find records? I actually looked this up earlier. <laughs> uh, the National Archives. Uh, ah. The National Archives of England, old UK. Uh, I'm going to put this link in there, but they, this is basically a finding aid for their records and what records are available. They have pension payments, they have some service records from the Royal Hospital Chelsea, they have discharge records, they have all kinds of stuff. So I'm going to put a link to this in the chat, but always start with a Google search. I would add too that Find My Past has a number of British yeah. military records on it. So you would want to look at that to see if they're in there. And there is also a website that I've looked at before. I can't quote the, the thing, but it's on British in India, a Genealogical Society of British in India. Uh, and they have extracted obituaries and military records, and all sorts of things. Um, and uh, it might be worth a Google search just to do a, a search on British India genealogy. And I think that you might find it. Mm -hmm. Very good. I'd like to, as, as a non-Irish expert, if that hasn't been clear already, um, I'd like to make um, a comment. I, I like what you said, John and Elizabeth, about Google it, use Google. So we know- That's what I do for everything. Yeah, exactly, Lauren, exactly. So- How do you know, I every, this pomegranate? <laughs> <laughs> in every aspect of our life, we can have something that's really good and we can misuse it. Um, so I know that when Google first really popped uh, way a number of years ago, I was like, oh, that's Google. Oh, I can't trust this. Oh, it's not that. Um, Google really, and many, many people have spoken uh, very knowledgeably and very cogently about it. Um, just like you wouldn't open the Encyclopedia Britannica to a particular page and say, yep, this is my fill in the blank. This is my best friend, my great, great, whomever. Google's really powerful. Um, so don't want to belabor the point, but oh my goodness, if you don't regularly Google things that you're not finding other places, um, they provide you with so many leads. And that's what we do as family historians, right? As people who want to find our stories, we try to find all the data we can to create all the context we can and to find all the information. I mean, that's, that's number one on the genealogical proof standard, right? a reasonably exhaustive search, you know, and Google helps us accomplish that. So, so good, good point, John. Kurt, before so, we move on, I sure. saw a question here. I, I kind of want to tackle because sure. I know, I know that Lauren knows something about this. Um, clan, clans and DNA. Um, you know, a lot of people seem to think, okay, I must be descended from these Irish chieftains, right? There's a lot of, a lot of stereotypes about that. Um, Lauren, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so kind of similar to clans and tribes in Ireland and in Scotland and in what is now considered the United States and many other places, just because you're from a particular clan, tribe, nation, um, or you carry a certain surname does not mean that you are automatically descended from a certain individual of power or um, influence in whether it's you know military campaigns political whatever um, and so we have a massive irish genealogy brick wall in my family and continuously say pretty sure thomas farrell was just dropped here by just a leprechaun fairy himself I don't know. I don't think he really exists. <laughs> I mean, he did, but he doesn't have parents. That's my, that's myself. Um, my uncle had been working on this research for longer than I had been alive and passed away. And so it's really hard, one, to go in and figure out someone's research for 20 years of a million leads <laughs> and like see where he was. Um, but he had done some separate DNA testing um, and sent it off 
more specifically um and you know the the company and i was sitting here going through my emails um just kind of basically came back and was like yeah you don't really match to ferals um you match to very very few um and the ferals that everyone assumes that if their last name is feral they're from county longford the theater goals but there are many different ferals there's like 15 different clans of feral um and so you probably come from a very small one um and with the stronger percentage still of norman like early or northern european um, ancestry probably from a, an agrarian society that was permanently settled by by normans themselves and that's you know the irish is kind of those those notes have come out or these particular individuals from that clan have not been testing um and you know you're more closely there's like some non-paternal event in there and like you're really clan dalton and i'm not surprised by any of this because every record i've seen with mr thomas farrell everything is different but it is still him um does it remember his parents names all that fun stuff um so that's yeah. just that comment good deal thank you thank you both for for that um, it's time, believe it or not, for another quarterly information break. So um, the luck of the Irish, even though I don't have much coursing through my veins, appears to have smiled on me and I can actually share my screen. So um, yay. So I just wanted, since we're talking about having a, a, a chat about Irish, I wanted to um, advertise, I said this wasn't an advertisement, I wanted to provide information that the periodical source index is now freely available on the Ancestry website. What made me think of that is for the rest of April and some of May, it still can be found on Find My Past. They were our most recent technology partner, uh, but a much bigger version of the index is available for free. No subscription required, no micropayment required for free on the Allen County Public Library website. And you just scroll down to about the midpoint uh, and you just click on the periodical source index and you'll be presented with this nice little, very simple, very straightforward graphic. And if we were interested in seeing what periodicals were subject indexed in Percy, we would click on the British Isles. We could pick a country, Ireland or Northern Ireland, pick Ireland. We can search across that entire area, that entire geographic area. There are a few records for Ireland. Notice the various subject headings. There are some ethnic headings, and then there are some record and subject headings. So as we scroll down here, there are thousands upon thousands. There's 15,000 periodical articles just on the history of Ireland. But you can see military records, 2,700, naturalizations, 50. Of course, the ever popular other category, almost 5,000 other records. So when, if you find a category that you're interested in, I know we've had some military questions this evening, so we can go down and click on military records, and that takes this multiple record set down to only 2,765, and you can then conduct searches through the titles of these articles to narrow it even further. But you can also organize the periodical title alphabetically. You can do ascending or descending in the year published, and you can organize the publisher and search through those various categories. So it's a great thing to play with, and I just invite everyone to, to play with it because it could help you with any of your research, including, of course, your Irish research. So that's uh, the info break for, for this quarter, uh, quarter hour. Let, let's get back to the growing list of exciting questions we have here. Um, Dolores asked, where do you start researching when all you have is a name and a possible date they came? I'm assuming came to the United States. Went to Ireland back in September and discovered one of my ancestors were Clayton and Patterson. So where do you start researching when all you have is a name and a possible date they came? Depends on when they came, depends on when they were born. Because if they're born, you know, after civil registration has begun, 
then you might be able to find them there. You might be able to find them in church records, but to figure out, okay, well, they just came from Ireland. I don't know where in Ireland. You could use those surname maps to figure out, okay, if they say immigrated in the 1860s or 70s, you could look at that Griffiths valuation map. The thing I showed on John Grenham's website and see, okay, there are a ton of people with this one surname living in this area, uh, but maybe not so much in these other areas. You can kind of narrow it down mm -hmm. that way. Um, you could also narrow down location, honest to God, by looking at some of those like ancient um, genealogies of Ireland, because while they can be rather romantic, especially depending on when they were written, they can give you an idea of where some of these people lived. Um, it will narrow down to a couple counties and you can kind of focus your attention on those counties. That's my recommendation, but it depends on, it all depends on when. Sure. I would just to add to that, make sure you look at all sources for that family on this side of the Atlantic. Yeah. Uh, look at the Catholic church or church records from America. Look for the baptisms of their children. If they were married here, uh, you definitely want to look for the marriage record and a church record here. There are Irish newspapers. There are um, even look, regular local newspapers might have some clues and obituary of someone might say where specifically they came from. So you want to make sure you exhaust everything in America as, as part of that search. And another thing to kind of add to that is that um, I know that the Boston pilots from around 1831 to 1921, they had a column called Missing Friends, which people could place notices or ads about lost friends or relatives who had immigrated from Ireland. So newspapers are really important for things like that and things like the Immigrant Savings Bank in New York. In New York look through the strangest records you can there's like a joke that the irish genealogist is so desperate for records they'll even look at dog licenses those dog licenses are very helpful so <laughs> look at them yeah I, I i think that may fit under lauren's concept of 4d look at all that stuff so even a gravestone sometimes will have a place of birth and, and, and may not be in the cemetery registers of the sexton's registers, but it may be carved on the stone. I've seen this before in different places. So there's all kinds of places where that where that name can be found. I feel like cookbooks because it's like Aunt Ida or like Mabel, you know, sometimes you get in the title of a recipe in the family cookbook, you might get some familial connection. Yeah. Very good. So the, our, our next question, we have the have quite a nice number here. My great, great grandmother, two great grandmother was from Derry slash Londonderry. I found her marriage license in Carrefergus County Atrium, Antrim, excuse me. She taught in Lane County Antrim. She was raised in the Catholic faith, although not married in the Catholic church. I looked for her father. Patrick Carlin, C-A-R-L-O-I-N, listed in her christening record. He is deceased on her marriage record of 1845. I've been unable to discover which part of the city, Derry, that Patrick lived. Well, there is a directory. Um, there are, so for those of us who, you know, do American genealogy, uh, there are city directories. There is a directory for, for dairy. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head what year, but you can at least look right. for the years around that time frame. Some of those are on um, by my past. Okay. Just trying to see the church records when they would begin in London Dairy. The London Dairy City has records. Um, Taking a look at my my book here to see if I come up with this. I don't. What see book what is that, John? I'm looking at uh, uh, James G. Ryan's Irish records, um, and Derry Cathedral has records going back to 1642. Uh, it's missing some records from between 1776 and 1828, uh, but they have been microfilmed uh, in Ireland, so that might be uh, something to look at. And there was there are a couple other parishes in in. Uh, the city of Derry also, St. Augustine's and uh, 
Christ Church. Those are C of I, though. Let's see. Um, Roman Catholic. It might be under a different parish altogether. Dairy City doesn't say when they begin. But there might be Catholic records sure. there in Derry. You'd want, you'd want to contact the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland or PRONI uh, to see um, what records might they might have. Um, and a good, very good guide is by a man named John Ralston, R-O-U-L-S-T-O-N. And it's, uh, it's the essential guide for looking at, at records in early modern Ulster. Um, it's called uh, Guide to Scots Irish Ancestors or something like that. I don't have the exact title on my head. I, I can probably look it up right here. But that's a good guide because he'll list all the church records that are there for the different counties and, and, and towns. Yeah. So um, a couple of times this evening, you've mentioned, um, between the two of you, you've mentioned Find My Past. I just want to make a special note. No, I don't work for Find My Past. I have not no investments in Find My Past. Uh, but it's an often overlooked database, I believe, if Every month, I, I'm privileged to take a look at user statistics, I say privileged, uh, for the Genealogy Center. And it's <clears throat> always uh, one of the least used databases, but they have just a tremendous amount of information. Obviously, it's not going to be the be-all and end-all answer. Obviously, they're still growing that and will forever, or as, for, as long as they're in business. But um, uh, you, you both made excellent suggestions to to. At least look there. It's, it's it's a quick look. It's either there or it's not. Um, so uh, I think oftentimes there's uh, good nuggets like right in front of us that we don't really uh, see. So um, great points. Let's take Judy's question here. My Irish family was here in Revolutionary War. Where would I find their immigration records? Their immigration and records in the homeland. Irish family here during the Revolutionary War. Where would I find their immigration and records in the homeland? <clears throat> that time period is John's wheelhouse. Well, I would just say, remember that, that Ireland and England and, and, and then the colonial period were all part of the same empire. So there weren't, there weren't immigration records that far back. Uh, there are for Germans coming into the country because they had to swear oaths. But, uh, but Irishmen coming in on a boat from Ireland to America in 1770s for example, would not have had to, to be immigrated, I mean, to be naturalized anyway, because they were all part of the British Empire. So you're not going to find British, uh, uh, an immigration or, or naturalization record uh, that far back. Um, so it's going to be very difficult to even document the ship. There are just a handful of, of lists of Scots-Irish like that, but you might want to look carefully at the community that they settled in in America in the colonial period. If they were here before the revolution, there were pockets of Scots-Irish, lots of them in Pennsylvania, some up in Maine and New Hampshire, some down in Virginia, mm -hmm. down in the, the trail there. So those are the, the main pockets that they, where they came in and, and look at the, at the community that they were in, look at the context of, of, the, of the time of, the, of who their neighbors were and where the town they were in because they may have come as a congregation they may have come with people that they knew and uh and so right. looking at the cluster of people that, that surrounded them yeah. can give you clues exactly great point it's absolutely great point um so let's take another question here um my irish oops that was the one i just read there we go um are there records of the scots that were granted land in ireland Sometimes, uh, again, it's, 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 it's material you'd want to get into the papers, the estate papers uh, of the families that they settled, where they settled, and to see if there are land records. There are some deeds that, that go back. Uh, some are at Prony, uh, and some are uh, in the National um, Archives in Ireland. Some are um, in the Registry of Deeds, mm -hmm. um, but yep. those are all a little bit later. Uh, and thinking, thinking the 17th century, it's going to be more difficult to find uh, deeds that far back. Uh, but there are other records of Scots-Irish in Ulster. There are, there's a military list of people who had arms in 1630. I found my ancestor on it. Um, and then the list people of where they were and what, what, what counties and what towns they were in or what estates they were on. That can be a clue then to look for, try to find the estate papers. If you're lucky, the landlord family has, has some papers that survive and those papers might be in an archives in Ireland or England. Uh, it, it might have a, a a source in it. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. We're at our last quarter hour information break. And um, what, what I would like to do for this uh, break 
is to uh, invite Lauren, uh, invite you to talk to us just a little bit about um, why someone should at least look at the schedule for Midwestern Roots when registration becomes available in a few short days. Awesome, yeah. Um, so registration opens March 23rd. Um, and so you wanna check that early and often for all the promotional deals and uh, just great opportunity to get in on the classes that you want as some of our um, offerings on Thursday do have limited seating. Um, but come hang out with us for three days of learning and in-person networking. Did I share yet? No. Um, there we go. Um, in-person learning and networking and a whole bunch of stuff that you've been missing for a few years. And we'll dive into how uh, mute food, music, fine art, and clothing can all be pathways to the movements of people across the nation and explore wonderful resources about the history and the people of the communities we love. Um, and so we have different session formats and lengths, storytellers with a host of different diverse backgrounds and experiences, different ages. They're not traditional genealogy speakers, but they have a lot to share with you. Um, all sorts of new immersive programs, tons of time for expert Q&A um, and so much more. Um, we did change things up a year this year to offer some coffee and themed snacks at different times. Um, and then um, some extra ticketed uh, special luncheons um, with Miami the Tribe of Oklahoma Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, who's board of director for us here at IHS, um, Diane Hunter, as well as a colleague of mine, Callie McCune, public historian on um, preserving family recipes and all sorts of amazing stuff, creative sessions, try on a hoop skirt and figure out what you can do in it. <laughs> um, so there'll be lots of fun and games and storytelling and just different. So, right. so uh, just to reiterate what you were saying, Lauren, and this is maybe the geeky part of me, I'm kind of excited that the Indiana Historical Society has gone a little bit out on a ledge and I think um, they can attribute that positive thing to Lauren or they can blame her. Oh, this is all Lauren's well, fault. But, but, um, I really like the, until the conference is over. I'm not. There you go. <laughs> I like the fact that there's a lot of what I would call in the conference context, non-traditional presentation. So they're not all one hour long. There's half hour, they're hour, they're more than an hour. There's all kinds of learning environments. And there's all kinds of experts that are gonna be available to help us do better research and to think differently about how we find all that data. So um, it, I think it will be very enjoyable. It's not um, like a traditional conference where you sit for 60 minutes, have a break, sit for 60 minutes, have a break, sit for 60 minutes, you get the idea. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm kind of excited about that. So let's um, hit the questions. I noticed my colleague, uh, uh, Elizabeth was reading through my notes. I didn't know that she had a camera in my office, but if we don't get to all of your questions as Elizabeth just put into the chat, uh, please email us your questions. We answer every question we get. Uh, and I think, knock on wood, rub the Blarney stone. You know, I think they're really good answers, uh, really great tips. So um, as Elizabeth told us a few seconds ago in chat, so let's uh, take Pat's question here. And if you'd like a copy of the chat, send us an email for that as well. I see a couple of people have been asking about it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Sorry. So so email is a good thing, yeah. Um, what records might be helpful to learn about the lives of Irish immigrants in the Five Points area of New York City in the mid 1800s? Does that, does that flash with you at all, Elizabeth? <laughs> yes, it does. Um, so, there is a book um, by Tyler Ann Binder. So when I worked at the Tenement Museum, Tyler Ann Binder was like the patron saint of the Tenement Museum. He was kind of, his book was like the Bible um, when talking about the five points. Uh, it is an excellent book. I highly recommend it. I'll actually put a link to the Amazon page. Not that I'm telling you to bind it, buy it. You can find it in libraries, but just so you have the full citation stuff. And okay. while you're doing that, just quickly, Elizabeth, what I call an insomnia buster, uh, if you find titles of books, use WorldCat. 
You know, you can search yeah. WorldCat for hours and hours and hours. Yeah. So put that title in, put subjects in, put it in WorldCat. And it has that little library finder thing where you put the zip code, your zip code in, and it will tell you which library is close to you have that particular book. So yeah. sorry for the interruption there. Elizabeth. No, no. But the five places are really interesting neighborhood because it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was called that because five streets literally inter intersected to make five points. But it was built on top of a filled in pond lake thing it flooded constantly there people did not have indoor plumbing in the five points so uh you're going to a well so most people did not have a spigot behind their building street flooding plus outhouses that were emptied once a week plus well water equals things like cholera what a cheerful thing to talk about st patrick's day but <laughs> go ahead i was just gonna say for those of us who don't have Irish ancestors yeah. in the five points in New York City, but we do have ancestors yeah. in a very urban area in Chicago or Gary, Indiana, or you know, wherever we are, still read this book. Yeah. Because a lot of it is the same in their daily life experience. And then also read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. So he's talking about Polish people. It's still the same. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Definitely recommend it. Good point. So there's a question here that we may be able to knock out quickly. Is there a good resource to determine Catholic versus Protestant surnames? I know that you, you both talked about that a little earlier, but is there a resource, a book, a website? How do you, Catholic, Protestant? Hmm. Well, there's different surname dictionaries that are out there, like Edward McLeisat, M-A-C-L-Y-S-A-G-H-T, uh, who did a, a series of books on Irish families and, and Irish surnames. There's a Scottish one by George F. Black called Surnames of Scotland that has a lot of good information on Scottish surnames. Um, sometimes there's, there's blended names, uh, the names that are, you find both or, the, or names can be altered. Uh, an O can be a come a Mac and vice versa. And um, okay. so it can be kind of hard to do. And there, there can be, it's not always clear. There can be Catholics that have English names or, or Scottish names. So um, not always clear. You were going to say, Elizabeth? I was going to say there's another one that, so some of these surname books are available online. Um, so there's one that I'm about to put into the chat uh, that is available online. It's called uh, Irish Names and Surnames by Patrick Wolf. So they're really well sourced. Um, some of them are, some of them can be kind of romantic, um, kind of depends. Uh, I want to actually take this moment to say, those of you who are putting your email addresses in the chat, asking us to send you a copy of the chat, love the enthusiasm. I do. But you guys got to send us an email because your messages will get lost. So send us an email. I will put our email address in the chat again. Okay. So let's move on to a couple of other quick questions here from our, our, our friend, Nancy. Locally, she uh, asked, I had someone tell me once that there is no such thing as Scotch-Irish. Would you please talk about that term, Scots-Irish? Well, I don't like the term Scotch, S-C-O-T-C-H. That's Irish, a trick. Because that, that, yeah. That's a trick. That, and that's, Scotch that's a trick. Is, is a whiskey. Uh, and, and, but, My favorite but drink. You can say Scots-Irish <laughs> is, is appropriate, or you can say Ulster Scots. Uh, people okay. in Ireland will call themselves Ulster Scots. Uh, not Scots-Irish, but people in America tend to use the term Scots-Irish. Uh, so it's a perfectly valid historical term that, I, that I've heard. I, I've seen a number of academic written works using the term Scots with an S, not C-H, right, right. Irish um, as, as a term. Uh, and it's just, a, it's, it's just a term used to apply to Ulster Scots, people who are Scottish origins, mostly from the lowlands and the borders area that came into uh, and plant, were planted into Ulster uh, in the 17th century. They, it was because uh, Ireland had been at war and at rebellion and, uh, and the English crown took over a lot of the lands that had been held by uh, Irish chiefs and, uh, and then they replanted the land. Some of the counties had what were called undertakers. They were people that are given large tracts of land and then they formally settled those areas like Londonderry and, and Cavan and those areas were founded by, by, by undertakers, whereas in Antrim, and uh, those other and down, those were more counties that were that just brought Scots in under, without formally under an undertaker, and uh, and they, they 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 came in in the 17th century and um, different times in the 17th century, and uh, and were often renters, usually renters on some larger estate. 
So um, what Nancy heard is correct. And that, that, that's a great explanation you provided, John. So it's Scots, not Scotch. So there's no such thing as Scotch as in drink Irish. It's, it's, a, it's likely a misunderstanding of the term Scots. So excellent, excellent description there, John. So moving on to a, a few more questions. Um, what is the best way to get my DARA, D-A-R-R-A-H family from York County, Pennsylvania in 1740 to Ulster, maybe Antrim, and then to Scotland? Well, I do the DNA for sure. If we have a Y DNA uh, line, for, that would be interesting. And you might get some matches in Scotland where that name is associated. Um, uh, it's it's pretty far back, and, and and when you get into that time period, it can be tough. Uh, you think you try to figure out where specifically in Ulster and where where they are and what estates they were on, and uh, and uh, church records are really spotty. And even when they do exist, they're often the records were not always kept very well. Uh, and that's my my experience dealing with those records. I've been to Prony and looked at them, um, but you need to get to, to find out where that that name is associated and. and uh, there are a couple of things you could look at uh, on the Prony website. Uh, they have what are called freeholders records. Freeholders were people that had uh, a number, enough land in freehold, rent, rented land that allowed them to be voters. Uh, they were essentially voters yeah. lists. And, uh, and so not everybody was, had enough land to become a voter, but, but it will show you, you might wanna look at the Prony website and get into the freeholders and then see where that Dara name uh, is associated in, in, in Ulster and in what counties and what towns, that would be a starting point. Then I'd want to get into the deeds uh, in the Registry of Deeds office to see where that name is associated. Look for it as grantors because there are grantor indexes. Uh, go to that website that, that Elizabeth had earlier, that index to the Irish Re Registry of Deeds to see um, uh, if the Dara name is there and what counties it's found in. And, and that's where I would start. Excellent. Thank you. I also so, want to add that North of Ireland Family History Society, they're doing a DNA, they've been doing this massive DNA project for several years where they've tested at least 2,000 people currently living in Northern Ireland. Um, so for anyone who's done an autosomal DNA test, they estimate that this covers approximately 20% of your ancestors who would have lived there in the 1750s. So it's definitely something to look at, which I'll put a link to that in the chat. So trying to cover just a few more questions, but with Elizabeth's invitation, if we don't get to your questions, please send us an email, genealogy at acpl.info. And I'm sure that's been in chat several times. Um, this is kind of a yes or no question. I'm gonna at least phrase it that way. Was there a pattern of immigration from Ireland to Holland? in the mid 1800s? Not that I know of, but the linen industry okay. was important. So you know, that's a factor. Okay, excellent. Um, can you help me understand the difference between the records held at Prony versus, and they have G-R-O-N-I, Grony? Yeah, the General Records Office of Ireland. Um, okay. That is for the Republic. Crony is the public records office in Northern Ireland. But if you have ancestors from one of those border counties, look in both places. In fact, just look in both places anyway. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. cover all your bases. It's interesting that you don't see that Grony abbreviation nearly as much, at least I don't, as Prony. So just an, an interesting observation. Um, so um, a lot of questions we're just not gonna get to. I wanna get to a beginner question so we kind of cover all the fronts. Um, um, Megan writes, I just started my Irish genealogy and this has been so helpful. I've been able to find um, male relatives easier than females. Well, um, we, we all lament that. Uh, besides marriage records, is there any other way to figure out who my female relatives were or more about them, specifically Irish? Aaron's Daughters in America is excellent historical context. Um, so the thing about, and this kind of goes with your research in 4D thing, Kurt and Lauren, the thing about doing Irish research, I think, is 
not just looking for the records, but also looking at the historical context, because so much is happening in Ireland starting in 1800 uh, and then going forward. Uh, just between 1845 and 1921, five million people leave Ireland. So, and the majority of which are actually young women, uh, women who are unmarried, traveling alone. Uh, that is not the golden rule, but it's statistically, they were immigrating in higher numbers than men. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. Reading books like this, so this book is by Hasia Diner, which I'll mention it in the chat. It, it gives color to understanding maybe why would a woman move to a certain place? Why would she marry a certain type of person? Uh, maybe it's because they're from the same county. Because let's not forget, Ireland, like many places, not everyone's going to get along. <laughs> So someone from Dublin might not like someone from Cork. In fact, that's going to be true, uh, possibly now. So look at that historical context, read more, uh, and that definitely helps. Um, and it can give you some clues as to where to look for certain things. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Um, pulling out just a couple of other quick questions. Um, any good tips and for reasons why a Catholic family would have changed its name around 1900? It depends on where they were living, I would think. Right, right. Yeah. That, that, that would make sense. Um, so here's, I think, our last, as we're right at the bottom of the hour, our last um, fairly detailed question for this evening. So alert, thinking caps on. Uh, John Lips, L-I-P-S-E, probably mispronounced that, Lips A, fought in the revolution with Washington according to his pension application, which was rejected because his records burnt in the Union Wars in Kentucky later. His application says he came from County Tyrone, but I've not been able to find any information on a Lipsy family there. Born in 1730s, I think lived to be 104. So have him on the side of the Great Pond, can't find him in County Tyrone. I Any? would guess that the family is German in, in Ireland. Um, and I would guess there might be from the Palatinate, Palatinate might be a variation of Leips, L-E-I-P-S or L-E-I-B-S uh, that came to Ireland and the name has changed somewhat. Uh, there were Germans in Ireland, not a lot of them, but there are some. Uh, and uh, they may have come there again because of the linen industry. Uh, there was a linen industry very strong in, 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 uh, in Ulster as well as in the lowlands area in Germany and in the, the, the low country. And uh, there was migration back and forth in the 18th century. So that would be my guess, just hearing that name, is that it's a, it's a Palatinate German family in Ireland before coming to America. And the whole Palatines to America series of periodicals, of book publications. Books, we could try that in, yeah. and yeah. And, and they're, there may be even special congregational records, but they would probably show up in the Church of Ireland records uh, in in that area in in Tyrone. But, but there's body. There's not a lot of records that go back that far. Yeah, excellent. Um, thank you so much. Um, I uh, kind of maybe misled you a little bit. Um, this may be a question, Elizabeth, that um, is kind of. Uh, in your area of expertise a little bit. John, you as well with DNA, but um, truly the last question of the evening. Um, if you've done your DNA on Ancestry and you're looking for family matches from Ireland, should you upload your DNA to GEDmatch? It can't hurt. Um, I would recommend uploading it to MyHeritage because uh, a lot of these DNA companies were not able to operate. Like Ancestry was not allowed to be testing uh, in Ireland and many other European countries for a while. So fewer people in Ireland have done the ancestry test. However, my heritage as a company, they were operating a lot longer. So I have found more people uploading my dad and my aunt's DNA into my heritage who currently live in the British Isles um, than I did in ancestry. So Ancestry might be better to find, uh, not Ancestry, my heritage, excuse me, it might right. be better to find if you're looking for people who are currently there, 
but look for DNA projects too. Uh, that's something you might want to look into. Very good, very good. Um, that will have to be our last question of, of the evening. There are still more in the uh, Q&A portion of, of Zoom. Uh, please feel free to send those to us at genealogy at acpl.info and we'll be happy to take, take a look at them. It's been really a fast 60 minutes here this evening and I wanna thank both you, uh, John and you, Elizabeth, for your um, participation this evening. and. Thanks so much, Lauren, for, um, for being with us. Um, it's nice to see our research roundtable initiative morph into, into this. Um, we've had a really nice number of participants uh, this evening. Um, I really hope that uh, people do have a little bit of the luck of the Irish as they continue to pursue their, their Irish ancestors. I'm gonna try my luck one more time here this evening and share my screen. And it does seem to be working now, which is awesome. Um, I wanted just to remind you of our Genealogy Center website that down at the bottom, here was tonight's program and the next three or four programs are listed here as well. So you can see what Tuesday is going to be and you can see what next Thursday evening is going to be. So please do frequent our website, genealogycenter.org uh, a lot and uh, register for future programs. Uh, Lauren, did you have any uh, final comments you wanted to make? Um, if you posted about Midwestern Roots, we'd love to see all of you there. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can shoot me an email at um, Indiana History, Indiana Historical Society. My um, email is lpakesel at indianahistory.org, my last name, um, and I'll answer all your questions. Excellent. And if you didn't get her email address, you know how you can solve that problem. Email the Genealogy Center and yep. we'll send you her email address. So thank you so much. I really do hope wherever you are in the country or world that St. Patrick's Day was wonderful for you or the remaining part is wonderful for you. And we so much appreciate you being with us this evening and look forward to you at future events. Thanks so much and have a good evening.